Well, it's a great honour and pleasure to have a chance to talk to Sir Frank Kermode, who... Kermode. Kermode, <laughs> to get it pronounced. Um, who we passed in the combination room for 20 years without <laughs> having a conversation, but now we have a chance to do so. Um, may I call you Frank? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, Anything but come out of <laughs> Okay. Uh, Frank, tell me when and where you were born. I was born in Douglas, the Isle of Man, in 1919, and I went to school there. Tell me something about your, if you want to, about your parents or grandparents or the family. I don't know a great deal about it. My, um, <clears throat> my mother's family was totally obscure. I never met any problem. Mm. Um, my father's father died young, in his twenties. And his mother uh, died when I was very small, two or three. So I never knew a grandparent. Mm. And I had no brothers or sisters. For, for a good long time. I, I, my sister was born when I was 12, uh, so of course I was not very close to her as I went away as soon as she, when she was five. I, mm. And then the war came and so I didn't go back really. Uh, <coughs> um, so I, I really didn't have a family in a curious kind of way. Well, parents. I have parents. <laughs> you can't disown them yet. Anyway, you may tell me why you did disown them, but um, sometimes parents either uh, directly or indirectly affect one's life. Um, can you tell me something about your mother and father? Yes, my mother was a farm girl, um, a village quite near Douglas called Kewag, which she sometimes, we would go for a walk and she would point out the village, but she would not actually approach it. She didn't want to go back mm. to it. My, <coughs> my father's family, uh, which I know only by hearsay, his father was an organist. Um, I imagine a spare time organist. Anyway, he died, I think, 28 or something like that. Um, he, there was some kind of Welsh connection. The fa some sea captain called Pritchard, which was the, my father's name was John Pritchard, Colonel, and he, he valued this connection with the bearded Welsh. Uh, That's Pritchard uh, with CH. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, though of course I never met hmm. the great seafarer. Um, my father was, um, we were an unlucky family in this respect. That, he was exactly the right age to be called up in 19, when conscription came in, in 1915, was it? Mm. And I was the right age to be called up in 1939. <laughs> mm. uh, uh, so in fact, we both had, uh, uh, our youths were deeply affected by the two wars. And, uh, um, I think I always rather resented that. Mm. There was no point in resenting him, mm. I didn't. Mm. Now, what else can I tell you about him? He was, he had a rather romantic George Gissing-like story because he, uh, while he was away in France during the First World War, his mother, uh, who of course had been widowed, um, remarried. They had a shop, uh, which we would now call an off-license, I think, kind of general mm. store. And the man she married staged a, a robbery at the shop, stole <laughs> the stock, and of course he went bankrupt. So he returned from France with no shop and no money and so on. Took temporary jobs and then got a, what he thought was a a job that would just see him through as a storekeeper, and he stayed in that for, for the rest of his career. Uh, he retired after the Second World War, I can't remember exactly when, and uh, it was a sad time because my mother uh, had dementia, 
and he had was extreme diabetic. So he, uh, in fact, died of it. I think, uh, living in a a sort of home for old men, although he was only about seventy. Uh, and they had a stronger connection with my sister, of course, and she mm. still did there uh, mm. than with me. So the Isle of Man is my home territory, and I sometimes feel quite strongly about it, but not often. <laughs> and, and so, well, I find that when I go there, I don't know whether other people ever feel this about their the their birthplaces. I, as soon as I get off the boat or the plane when I go there, I feel depressed. And I'm always glad to get out of this. <laughs> Quite and a lot of people feel that. I'm very unkind to my mm. sister, who's an extremely nice person. Mm. But, uh, mm. Well... Were either of your parents interested in books and reading? And Not really, no. My father, I'm sure, never read a book in his life. Uh, <laughs> my, my mother had a kind of interest in in poems. There's a there's a Manx poet hmm. whom I bet you've never heard. His name is T. E. Brown. He was a friend of Quilla Cooch. Hmm. He was a master at Clifton. Hmm. Uh, but he was a Manxman and he he's great still or perhaps I don't know now. I don't think there are many Manx people left hmm. in the Isle of Man. But there he, <laughs> he, I remember the 50th or was it the 100th anniversary of the birth of Brown when there was a tremendous do in the uh, uh, in the town and the speaker on that occasion was Quilla so uh, um, he was thought quite seriously of being not totally forgotten but even he's forgotten is that all his good poems, well, fairly good poems, uh, uh, in Manx dialect mm. uh, and um, nobody understands that since my mother died. <laughs> yeah. um, so no, we can't. She she recites some passages of Brown's poems to me when, hmm. when I was young. I still remember some of them, but uh, it's rare now to come across anybody, even specialists, who haven't heard of T. Brown. So, hmm. so I don't go around hmm. reciting. <laughs> I don't feel so ashamed at not knowing about him. Um, tell me about your uh, schools, I mean, the, the ones that you remember, the, your... Schools. Well, the routine uh, for a boy. Remember, I was at school in the 30s and everybody was very poor. And the other two, my early schools, infant schools, so I mean, you could tell the difference between those of us whose parents had enough to live on and those of us who didn't because those of us who didn't wore clogs. They were issued by the by the town. Clogs? Clogs. Did you wear clogs? Well, I didn't wear clogs. I was mm. upper class. Ah. Uh, uh, you could tell. That I remember that when, when they ran wearing clogs, sparks mm. would come from behind. <laughs> it was very impressive. But I, was, I belonged to the leather wearing classes and uh, there was a real distinction mm. in the two. Um, I went through the usual things uh, uh, to the grammar school, mm. Douglas High School, it's called now comprehensive, of course. And um, it was a good school in the sense that it, I, you might have thought that its curriculum had very little to do with the kind of life that people led in the Isle of Man, but it had a lot to do with getting places in universities. Mm. And, uh, and the teachers, I think, or some of them, well, most of them rather limited now by hindsight. But on the other hand, they were quite good at getting people through exams. Mm. And, uh, they were Ox Oxbridge types, or? Nobody went to Oxbridge mm. because they couldn't afford it. Mm. There were no scholarships that were open to... Uh, and none of the teachers had been to Oxford? I, I uh, most of them, I think, had been to uh, the old Victoria University, you know, mm. uh, Leeds, Liverpool, Manchester, mm. around about there. <coughs> some of them were ex-servicemen, some mm. of them lacked an arm and that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, uh, some of them, I think, by hindsight, were suffering from sort of traumatic 
Sounds like true. evil in war to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, there, there was quite a bit of competition. Nobody, oh, not quite nobody, one or two boys whom I knew had parents who could support them hmm. at Oxford, Cambridge. Uh, but mine certainly couldn't. Uh, one was scholarship. Uh, there were three, I think. Um, I won the best of them, but the best of them was tied to Liverpool University, so I went there. Were well, there any, just on your school, uh, two things that often are revealing. Were, was there any teacher you remember who did um, inspire you in any way or have any effect on you? On you? Yes, um, but in a very slight way, I hmm. think. Uh, uh, I, I remember a teacher called Pendlebury, who was in fact uh, waspishly bad tempered, but in fact obviously did like poems and liked you for liking them. Hmm. There was a very romantic young French t teacher who used to croon Lamartine. <laughs> uh, there was a certain amount of savagery in the, uh, in the teaching. We all, we all got beaten. Really? With the mm. Frequency. Uh, you got beaten f for not doing things, or for doing things. One mm. way or the other, you got caught. Mm. Uh, anyway, they, they did their job, I suppose, although they might have been hard put to explain the relationship between what they did and, and what became of the candidates later. Um, and what what sort of subjects were you, by that time, were you showing any particular interest in, in literature or...? Yes, I, I, I was. I, I was... I had lots of time. They didn't know quite what to do with that. I... I, um, I was more than a year ahead of the class that I was in. Hmm. which is a, a thing I would never have allowed if I'd known what it entailed. There's a big mm. difference between uh, 16, 17 and a mm. half, mm. Uh, I think. Um, consequently, uh, I've sort of finished with school far too early. I mean, I'd done what they were there to provide, mm. so they didn't know what to do with me for a year and a half or so. That's a regrettable thing. I needed some help at that point. Hmm. The school did not have a good library. Uh, it, it didn't have teachers who had the kind of time. They were very generous at that time uh, in things like sports and music hmm. and so on. But they didn't want to buckle down and teach you Greek, hmm. if, if that's what you wanted to do. You could, you could do that, but it was done very half-heartedly. Hmm. So, so, in a way, I should have had a year luxuriating in a, a wide field of study, but I didn't. I just sort of went through the routines again for another year. I, trying to add other things, I, try, I, I tried to add Greek. Uh, I had a decent Latin, and good English, and fairly good French. Uh, so, I think it wasn't too bad. Do you remember any books that um, particularly uh, any books you, at, at that time were any books that you particularly enjoyed or influenced you or excited you? Independently of school? Or, yes, or yeah. independently or at I, school? I suppose so. I was reading books which uh, you'd expect a, a literate boy of Seventeen to a mile, like mm. Graham Greene, and uh, uh, but I wasn't particularly devoting myself to the classics. Mm. And, uh, but reading a lot, yes, mm. yeah, spurts of enthusiasm, um, leading a good life. Really, I had an ex a good friend who didn't survive. Um, bicycles and beautiful countryside, mm. and all that was. Very enjoyable, and, and books, of course, which you both read and discussed. And, mm. and so on. He went to Oxford, actually, um, and uh, was in the Eighth Army. Uh, so we kept in touch. He was important to me 
but he died in his fifties. Uh, what was his name? Quail. Quail. Uh, uh, anyway, then, uh, can I pass on to Liverpool? Last, last question about school. I mean, hobbies, uh, sport, music, sport, cycling. <laughs> very keen on sport and music without being very adept at mm. either. Mm. Um, I played football and, and got into a very poor school team. Mm. <laughs> as <laughs> <But> a goalkeeper? <laughs> no, no, no. I was a left half, as we used to call them. Oh, yes. Yes. Like Billy Wright. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. A parallel that no doubt occurred to me. <laughs> Anyway, I, I, no, I took part in things like that and, and played cricket. And, uh, we weren't well equipped. For, we were a very poor school. Mm. We had a muddy uh, playground, um, field, really, mm. it was. Uh, uh, volunteer refereeing, of course, mm. from the teachers who wished they were at home, uh, mm. umpiring. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so it was. It fell rather f far short of the best public school standards. So <laughs> and music, you mentioned, and may come up later. But has music been important through your life? Very, absolutely, centrally. Yes. Um, not as an executant, which mm. I'm not good at. I, I did try to play the clarinet and the violin, but. Uh, uh, badly, you know, mm. even I could tell it was bad. <laughs> uh, um, but certainly the interest has been has been absolutely central. Mm. Uh, what particularly? I mean, which composers, which periods? Well, I suppose in the in the, in the early days when I remember there was a gramophone at home, but my father my father's records. Were you know, the kind of, you know, when father papered the parlour, that kind of <laughs> voice on. And I acquired some records, purely at random, as far as I could see. Would be, uh, so I became uh, quite a fan of Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Schumann, not mm. Schwarzkopf, mm. but Schumann. Mm. Uh, and I, there, there, were, there were all sorts of things I knew at random. Mm. I had no structured knowledge of, of music at that time. Uh, but the records, which some of which my sister still got, I think, uh, were interesting. In fact, some of them are kind of museum pieces now. Mm. Uh, mm. <laughs> um, and then it was only when I, I got to to uh, university that I I began to be instructed in these things. I I became a, a kind of assistant at the Liverpool Philharmonic. Hall, either selling programs or, or conducting people to their mm. places. So I got to hear all the concerts mm. for nothing, and there were two a week in the season. So I, I got to know the repertoire, a sketch of the repertoire, mm. anyway, and I followed that up. I did really know quite a lot about some things. There's still, mm. there's an awful lot of music I, I mm. can't claim to know. And the end of one has one's, one's favourites, which would certainly include the Mozart operas, for example, mm. um, Beethoven, certainly, Schubert, certainly. Uh, so the focus is, mm. is in, in Viennese, piano, mm. I suppose. Mm. It's a little more adventurous than that. Mm. Do you does it connect with your work at all in the sense that you listen to it when you're writing or...? Um no, I, I, I used to do that. I find I can't do it now. Mm. I, I, I haven't got that double attention, mm. Mm. or inattention, perhaps mm. you'd have to call it. Mm. No. no. Because some, some writers actually write with music going through their mind. Maitland, for instance, used to... Maitland, F.W. Maitland, the historian. Did he? was a fan of <coughs> Wagner, but also other music, and he... People have analysed his writing to show that it actually 
has the rhythms and, and uh, movements of classical, classical yeah. composers as it, uh, concealed in it. You write the Liebstor, this is yeah. as you're writing about the law. Or whatever, <laughs> it, make... it sounds odd, but there it is. Okay, well, let's go on then to university. You went to Liverpool to read English, presumably, mm. did you? There, I think, uh, although I suppose the truth would be that if I could have gone to Oxford Cambridge, I would have done. Mm. Uh, I don't feel very short-changed about that because it was a very conscientious job they did in Liverpool. Mm. And with good people, good representative people, including the necessary Levisite. And, mm. you know, uh, mm. uh, so we were given some idea of what the subject was about. Uh, and also a lot of hard philology, which uh, which, they, which is sort of dropped out. Mm. People here don't on their own do much of it. Mm. Uh, um, but we had severe Anglo-Saxon Middle English courses, mm. um, uh, and we had also to learn a new language during mm. that period. So that's when I began. Italian, which I kept up. Mm. Uh, um, so I think that was a good three years. Mm. Um, again, uh, the old saying is you learn probably as much or more from the best of your friends. Mm. These games. And I think that was the case with me. That, that as a kind of inspiration in what it meant to be uh, a, a truly literate person, I think. My example would have been another undergraduate rather than the mm. teacher. Mm. The whole period was somewhat overshadowed by the, uh, the war. Mm. <coughs> this is the late 30s now. Yeah. Yes, I, I went up in 1937 mm. and uh, I was in the Navy by 1940. Mm. Uh, they'd given me, I, they could have called me up earlier, but they mm. gave me a year to, because I'd done two years of the degree mm. course, you were allowed to finish it. How I found myself in the Navy is kind of completely <laughs> complex. Um, Liverpool's near the water, I suppose. <laughs> That's right. From the, well, in fact, the, 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 the mechanics of it was rather odd because I, I had summer jobs, one of the summer jobs I had was as a purser on one of the ferries that mm. went to Liverpool or, Gla or Ardrossen mm. or Belfast and so on. Very kind of enjoyable job, mm. summer job. And the, uh, the ship in which I was serving there was, of course, uh, commandeered at once by the Navy and they, because they needed people to sail these things. Mm. Mm they just commandeered the crews as well. So yeah. I got forcibly <laughs> entered into uh, there and given an emergency commission. Mm. Uh, I remember talking to Alan Ross, who was of course mm. a war hero mm. uh, in, in um, uh, what do they call those fast motorboats, mm. he won the DSO and all this mm. um, Being amazed to know that I had actually received a commission without having had any training whatsoever, <laughs> <laughs> or any time on the lower mm. deck. Mm. And it was entirely a freak of that, of that, mm. of that sort. Mm. Uh, it made me an utterly useless acquisition for, the age, <laughs> for, a long time, for quite a long time. However, I had nearly six years of that, so yeah. mm. um, where were we? Well, I, yes, let's just go back to the university. Um, sometimes there is, again, someone whose lectures or supervisions or whatever affects one later on in one's life at the first time at university. I was wondering whether you remember any of the teachers who... Yes, I do. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the part of the course which is the best test, really, of literary ability is one borrowed from Cambridge, namely the, uh, the um, what do they call it here? Um, ah, it's the one where you're confronted with the I. Richard's test, so to speak. You know, mm -hmm. Confronted with passages, you're asked certain things about the period of the language, what time, 
Gobbits, are they? Or oh, that was at Oxford. There. Gobbits, is a, gobbits is the slang term for it. Oh, uh, yes. it Unseen. It has, has a posher term. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, uh, it's been in my life for 60 years. I also know what it is, but I, I can't remember. Anyway, these are the lapses of memory that you mentioned. Uh, and there, I think you did see um, a side of the teachers which is not merely routine. Mm. Obviously, they could they could lecture on Wordsworth or whatever, mm. but when when they showed you how to deal with pieces of um, um, raw mm. data of this kind, mm. uh, uh, they did expose their own sensibilities. As mm. you could and that, that was good. There's a move now to do away with, there's always a move to do away with things. <laughs> Here, yeah. some people dislike that. There's mm. a compulsory paper and tripod mm. still mm. here mm. on those lines. Mm. Too hard, too stressful. Yeah, too <laughs> <laughs> They're trying yeah. to do that with school children who are learning languages to try and get rid of the oral part I, of it. I, had, I couldn't believe mm. that. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> too <laughs> stressful. So, this is too stressful. Yeah. Well, they abolish the schools. Yes, too, exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so that that was a, a good test. So I do remember one or two uh, actual episodes. I remember a, a man called Arthur Humphreys who uh, was very young. He 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 had. Is that with a Y? Humphreys with a Y. E Y, I think. Yes. Uh, he had been a Commonwealth Fellow at Harvard. <coughs> he came to, yeah, as a very young man, mm. and very earnest. Uh, he, he later became a professor at Leicester. Mm. And he was, he was not thought to be of the top mm. rank, but he certainly impressed me on one or two occasions there. I remember one particular uh, poem of Yeats, which we Apart, which one? Which I'm a fan can? of Yeats, I say. You're a fan of Yeats? Ah, he's my favourite 20th century poet. Yes. Ah, well, you will certainly know the poem. Mm. Suddenly I saw the cold and rook delighting. Oh, yes, of course. Every time I see rooks, I think of it. Yeah, it's mm. a wonderful poem. Mm. Technically superb, too. Mm. Anyway, um, we once spent an hour together on that, and I remember thinking I'm never so impressed. Mm. By a piece of teaching. <coughs> right, so you were impressed by this man's yes, I, teaching. Uh, mm. I remember that episode, somehow popped into my head as mm. we were speaking, mm. it does from time to time. And uh, it, is a, it is an admirable poem. Mm. Uh, mm. uh, well, for me, it, they're all admirable, so <laughs> <laughs> it's just a degree of admirableness. Um, I even got a little tree in my garden, planted from the wood where he used to go. And uh, unfortunately, I thought it was a hazelnut because it, one of my favourite poems is uh, "Song of Wandering Angus," and the, so I thought it was a uh, hazelnut that he mentions in that. But my wife rather amusedly pointed out that this tree, which had been carefully brought to me, turns out to be a beech tree, <laughs> a beech nut. But there we are. It's it's Yeats's tree all the same. Well, he was inaccurate about that. <laughs> Good. That's he comforting. couldn't find the Lake Isle of Innisfree Road. No, no, I, I went to look for it. And I was quite surprised not to find it there. Um, so, well, of the, of the, you mentioned you learnt a lot from your um, contemporaries. Were there any who went on to be academics or...? Yes, there was one of the, the most impressive... In fact, the most impressive... Uh, student of that age mm. that I had ever come across, a man called Peter Ewer, who um, uh, was a conscientious objector and spent time in prison during the war. He wrote a book on the age while in prison. Mm. The mm. I think the first year's study of the age was called Towards the Mythology. Mm. I don't know if you've ever seen it. No. You are published in 1946, mm. uh, when he was, I think, still in jail. In, uh, mm. uh, he, gave, he gave up, actually. Mm. He didn't hold out for the whole war. He had mm. two sentences. Mm. And then he joined, uh, um, you see, he refused 
the kind of auxiliary services that you could adopt if you didn't want to be you know, uh, until he served his time and then he joined UNRWA mm. and he had an amazing <laughs> career in in Greece because he, he rapidly learned modern Greek he had good mm. Greek and he, he became head of UNRWA for the mm. whole of Greece that's the United Nations relief and something mm, like so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I remember him Mm. Uh, he was very good too. When I was away during the war, uh, in I, I was in Iceland for, for two years. Uh, he would send me a book, a book a month. He was my mm. book a month mm. for twelve. <laughs> and the books that he sent were a kind of testament to the taste of of uh, serious young men in his time. There were things like uh, Virginia Woolf between the acts, mm. uh, Gordon. Letters from Iceland, mm. <laughs> as, I, mm. as he knew I was in Iceland, which he mm. shouldn't have known. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and there's a rather distinctive array of, uh, of classy books that he said. Anyway, he later, he and I were appointed at the same moment, actually, to lectureships at Newcastle. Mm. And I did, didn't stay there very long. Uh, but he did. He stayed there the rest of his life and was, uh, was head of his department. Mm. And the rest of his life, unfortunately, was not very long. He died at 50. Mm. And he was the, uh, in, in some ways, the, given his age, I think he had achieved more than anybody else mm. in the profession. Uh, mm. He did good mm. stuff at Liverpool too. Mm. Good. Well, you mentioned Iceland and the war. Is there anything else, any memories of the war and your notable contribution to it? Spike, it sounds like Spike Milligan and you know the <laughs> war and how I won it, but um, were there any yeah. things about the war that, apart from reading, having a chance to read books? Well, I had lots of time for reading, that's true. And uh, um, curious enough, I, I watched a programme on television last night about uh, kamikaze. Oh yes, I've uh, recorded it, I haven't seen uh, it yet. Mm. Well, it's... Uh, I, I had a special interest in it because I was there. You see. Mm. I, um, I, I was never actually under attack like kamikaze. But you were in the Pacific, were you? Yes, I was mm. there. In fact, uh, after the, the... When the European War was obviously mm. nearly over, mm. we was, I was in an aircraft carrier which was sent out to join them. They didn't, as, as the man rather cruelly points out in the documentary, they didn't need us, the Americans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but still, it seemed appropriate that we should turn mm -hmm. up for the return of Singapore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so on. Uh, and in fact, the, the fleet, which, the, the British fleet, which went to uh, the Pacific, was huge. Mm. It was only in relation to the American fleet, which mm. was enormous, mm. was and where they took the, the Americans took the brunt of the suicide attacks. Mm. We didn't. We were kind of. I don't know how strong your Japanese geography is, but the, 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 they were they had to take Okinawa. Yes, yes, <coughs> yes. I know where Okinawa. Is. <laughs> but, but do you know where Sakashima? Is? Yes, yes. There have ah. been films about that. Mm. What's it? I think there have been some recent films Hello, about that uh, taking of it. Yeah. Well, Sakashima was, was our, we were supposed to keep that mm. tidy, mm. Well, but the Americans took all the, uh, but it was, it, was, it was very interesting to see this recreation of it. Mm. Uh, uh, in fact, it kept me awake last night because I hadn't revisualized it for mm. so many years. Mm. Uh, I really had some difficulty in explaining to myself why I was there at the time. <laughs> <laughs> mm. yeah. um, Did you encounter the Japanese at all in the war or after? Well, only at the end of it, mm. yes. Mm. At the end of it. We went to uh, Hong Kong, which of course got occupied, mm. to take off people from the prison camps. Mm. It was an extraordinary experience, which, because I was put in charge of of this operation, 
the camps were uh, mixed. Mm. Um, the, 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 Ballard's book is yes. about Shanghai, actually, but it, it's very similar. Yes, I've read that. To, to mm. Hong Kong. Mm. And uh, so, of course, the, there were lots of very young children who mm. were, um, born in the camps, and mm. therefore not more than four years old, probably. Mm. So I had this extraordinary gang of men, women, and children to look after mm. uh, uh, at the end of the war. I had Japanese working parties. Uh, so I did have some dealing with, mm. with Japanese through the OCOs and so on. Mm. Um, we've skipped ahead, but that is quite an interesting little bit of my story, mm. I think. We, uh, an aircraft carrier, the, the, the aircraft carrier that I was in was not a fleet carrier, it was a smallish mm. one, mm. Uh, but it's still quite a big ship. Mm. And we had to find space, not only for a full crew, but for all these people, mm. uh, men, women, and children. And we had to find, and that was the real headache, we had to find water for them. Uh, we had people at the showers with stopwatches, <laughs> 30 seconds <laughs> in the shower. I was like that. Uh, and they were all really ex-civil servants uh, or business people who'd been caught in. Hong Kong uh, at the beginning of the war. They were all suffering from very, very, they're all uh, miserable. And they all expected what they couldn't get, that is the home comforts. Showers. Kind of and <laughs> Long showers. <laughs> mm. and by the time we got to Sydney, which is quite a long mm. trip, mm. there was a lot of discontent to deal with. And, uh, uh, Perhaps I was not all the good, or perhaps not very good at dealing with it, I can't remember. But anyway, by the time they, they left the ship at Sydney, they were all pretty bad temper, and mm. so was I. <laughs> <laughs> I was so glad to see the back mm. of the wall. Mm. Uh, certain colonial uh, habits reasserted themselves mm. when they got into a British atmosphere. Mm. Uh, they demanded so much, quite mm. extraordinary. Mm. I was trying to explain to them that our sailors were going without charts in order that they should have them. Mm. They still wanted more. Mm. And, uh, uh, so I, I was given an insight into aspects of the colonial character. Mm. Okay. Mm. You say you jumped ahead. Um, is that because there are other things about the earlier part of the war that you remember? Uh, you put me in mind as I started talking about the uh, the um, kamikaze and kamikaze. Mm. Well, I know that the, the, the early part of the war was the two years in Iceland, mm. uh, uh, which was very different experience. Mm. We were trying to lay a boom uh, across a, a very beautiful fjord, which had a gap, maybe one and a half, two miles. And so it seemed a reasonable proposition to put a boom across um, in order to, order to give the ships which came into the harbour, including the Russian convoys and so on, mm. give them a peaceful night or two, mm. you know, because it's free of submarines and so on. Um, and we were supposed to be good at this boom name. <laughs> Which you weren't. <laughs> well, we were completely unequal to the conditions. Mm. We, um, we had. What was, what was I doing in this? Anyway, uh, the, we were a depot ship containing thousands of tons of metal in various forms, which mm. we were going to. Well, you have an idea what a mm. boom. Mm. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But it has a gate. Mm. It's the gate is the complicated mm. uh, And every time we got it nearly down, there would mm. be a, a hurricane come down the field and blow it all away. And we, we had to mm. wait for a, another boom to come up from Glasgow, which would mm. take about three months. Mm. Meanwhile, we had nothing to do. Nothing to do. Except read the monthly books. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, we got 48 hours leave every two months, we, which 
you can go to Reykjavik. Reykjavik was an extremely dull town, but there was an English bookshop which specialised in the old everyman library type. So I've still got the rows of Dostoevsky and that sort of red binding that kind of thing. That's what kept on saying, I think, it really was two years of pretty dreadful. People did go crazy. Our uh, men there, uh, there was no leave from Iceland, not even compassionate leave. So I remember a man from Hull whose uh, wife and children had been killed, and you know, he wasn't allowed to go home. <coughs> so a lot of misery about that. Mm. Uh, all you could do, you could fish. Mm. You just throw a line over the side and pull it back with a fish on the end. Mm. Uh, now, uh, Iceland has not tempted me. I went. To, I was asked. To, <laughs> I was asked to a big celebration in the Isle of Man. Uh, they have a, a ceremony called Timor ceremony mm. on July the fifth, which is is where the laws are read in Manx and so on. And they, the sort of procession to this artificial hill in the middle of the island. And they invite the prime ministers or the deputies, the deputies come, not the prime ministers, to this annual thing. Mm. And I, I, they ask some uh, fairly well-known natives like me to come mm. and join the party. Mm. And I found myself, I had a very good time actually, because I sat at dinner with Mary Robinson, who was delightful. Oh, yes. But the, I also sat beside the Deputy Prime Minister of Iceland and told him mm. of my years <laughs> in his daily work. Mm. He said, well, would you like to come back? And I said, well, I think he said, no, <laughs> <laughs> not, not even politely. <laughs> um, yes, anyway, that, that, that was the first half of the war, more or less, with Iceland, the second half was Pacific. Mm. When you, should we move on beyond the war? Is yes. That okay. Um, you came back. Did you did you do a PhD or? Um I started one. I never actually finished it. Mm. Um, uh, I, I got a job, mm. and that seemed to be why you wanted a PhD in the first mm. place. Mm. <laughs> this was the one at Newcastle, was it? Yes. Yeah. What, when was that? Nineteen forty-seven. Seven. I was. Extremely ill equipped for it because I, I hadn't had any, I hadn't done any serious mm. work for, for, for nearly six years. Mm. Um, we were given a tremendous load of teaching. Uh, people say they're they're very overworked now. I can't understand them really. Mm. They, if they get overworked, they get three years off, don't they? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there we would have John Butt uh, mm. yes. was my boss. And uh, a wonderful example of someone who knows how to work, you know, mm. and a really steady grind, and did it far more than his share of the teaching and so on. But um, I was landed, for example, with the Shakespeare course, and so limited was the accommodation that you had to give the lectures twice over, uh, and that meant you were giving a lecture a day pretty well. Apart from, and John Butt would, would say in his gentle way, uh, some of these students, a lot of them of course come out of the army, mm. they were 27 years old, mm. not, uh, uh, and they all wanted to be processed quickly so mm. that they could get jobs. And, mm. uh, he said, they, they come and say, that they keep hearing about I.A. Richards, but they don't know anything about them. Mm. and they want to know, and if they want to know, we must tell them. Mm. They say, will you give a course of lectures on my written so, mm. with a, with a two days notice. To <laughs> <coughs> but, but you did that kind mm. of thing. We, mm. we, everybody worked extremely hard. But you remember, perhaps not, you remember the conditions in 1947? No, I, was, I just came back to England in 47 from India, uh -huh. and I was at you know, only six or something like that. So, mm -hmm. it was. I remember. I mean, I remember the cold and 
misery oh, of Oxford yeah. in 1947. But Cold, half starved, mm, mm, horrible. Mm. Newcastle seemed to me a particularly awful place. This is very unfair. Actually. Mm. It's a beautiful place. Mm. Anyway, I uh, was offered this. I'd, I'd had a very good uh, supervisor, uh, but I'd gone immediately back to Liverpool when I got demobbed because I, I, uh, I had no money and I had a graduate fellowship for Liverpool. Mm. So, uh, mm. and the man who, taught, who looked after me uh, happened to be the only absolutely top class scholar that I worked with, a man called Gordon. Um, who was a, a what was his first name? Donald J. Mm. Donald J. Gordon. D. J. Gordon. Mm. Mm. He, uh, he, uh, he was a brilliant career that broke up on alcohol. Mm. And, mm. Uh, a disagreeable man in many ways, but uh, he certainly... Is he dead? <laughs> he died. Uh, yes. He's safe. <laughs> He's safe to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a lot about him in the autobiography, mm. if, mm. if you ever get around mm. having a look at that. I'll see if I can find your copy. Mm. I'd love to have that. You can put a plug for it. Your autobiography is, I was told last night, and I've seen it, but I've forgotten it. It has a, a clever title, I was told. Uh, it's called Not Entitled. Uh, Not Entitled, that's uh, right. It's partly about a prevailing sense of not being entitled that mm. I've always had. Mm. Uh, <coughs> but, um, so you did start with a PhD with Gordon, and then... Um, on, right. on what was the subject? Well, he, he, he was a Renaissance scholar, and that was what I wanted to be. I wasn't, I think, perfectly equipped for the job. But I, I, I began studying the, i show you this, rather on the record outside, I suppose, but the poet Cowley, who, who uh, flourished around about the time of the Restoration. Abraham Cowley, yes. Abraham Cowley. Yes. He wrote a part of an epic poem called The David Years. Mm. And uh, it's adorned by thousands of notes. Mm. It's, it's trying to meet the requirement that epic should be instructive in a, in a, a, a universal kind of way. Mm. Mm. So with this tremendous learning pact in the mm in the notes, and my task really was to find out where he got it all from. Mm. It's rather disappointing that most of it was taken from popular encyclopedia, yeah. as if he looked it all up on the internet. <laughs> However, it gave me sort of familiarity. Working on his work gave me a lot of familiarity with um, uh, books I never would have mm. come across otherwise. Treatises on marriage in the early 16th century. Mm. I can't see. Mm. Um, so I enjoyed all that very much. Did you do it? I mean, your work is very erudite and also has notes and, and cross references. Did you develop any particular system of annotations or do you just take notes from books as you read them or do you put them on cards or do you have any? Uh, I'm very unsystematic, I'm afraid. I, mm. I do make, take notes. Mm. I don't take them carefully enough. So I sometimes find when I look back at my notes, I don't know which book they came mm. from. Mm. <laughs> and I often thought, I really must change my life in that respect. But it's too late now. <laughs> <laughs> you, you took them longhand with a pen, presumably, for a long time, and then with a typewriter, maybe. Yeah, oh, yes, yes, mm. typewriter, mm. most of the mm. time. Mm. Uh, well, no, I still do it with a pen or pencil. I don't and how I'm how do you them. find what you're looking for? I mean, are, are they indexed in any way or in, arranged in folders? Oh, or? goodness me, no. No. Uh, no. They're arranged in heaps. Ah. <laughs> and, uh, well, I'm curious enough that the, the, these American colleges which try to buy your Mm. Thing. They rather like it, but they like them to be messy, so they mm. give some of the work sort of might Yes. Yeah. Are they going to America? Some, some have already gone. Some have okay. gone. Yeah. Mm. Uh, 
And do you have a big library, or did you have a big library? I had a big library, but uh, of course it met catastrophe, uh, which you probably, it was all of the local papers, but you don't read the local no, thing. No. When I, I moved house, I, had, I, I lived in, a, in Luard Road. Yes. And uh, then I was divorced. I was living alone there, and I, if I decided to move, I moved to uh, um, where I am in uh, Pinehurst. But the uh, 2,000 of my books were destroyed on, on, in transit from Lua Road to Pinehurst by a mix-up between uh, the city removal, the city garbage people, and the removers. They're a boxy mix-up. And, and, oh, and they ground my the best part of my library. Oh, how extraordinary. It sounds like Borges or something. <laughs> Too improbable to be true. How extraordinary. Uh, uh, I wouldn't have had any room for them now, I think, if mm. I'd... But, however, they were the best of my books. They happened in the room where I kept the best books. What, what year was this? When was this? Sorry? When did this happen? And Eleven years ago. Mm. I, it began, the insurance company was generous, I thought, they gave me quite a lot of money, so I went out with the notion of replacing at least some of them, but I gave that up. Mm. So, Did you have a list or know what they were? I, I had a not complete list, mm. yes, but this just opened up an appalling prospect of what, what, what was gone and what was irreplaceable. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, Things annotated things. Yes, uh, I was going to say. Uh, things with ins important inscriptions and so on. Mm. <coughs> also, manuscript material, which uh, people, uh, mm. important people, mm. Uh, mm. sent me. All that was lost. Mm. Uh, you get over it awfully quickly. I remember yes. s sitting outside the house in Luar Road thinking, this is the worst day of my life. Hmm. Uh, uh, but quite soon thinking, I can all sorts of, think of all sorts of things much worse than this that could have happened. You, know, you didn't get a sense of, sort of relief, I mean, that, that I sometimes, when i now beginning to throw away papers, which I thought I'd have to keep, I get a sense of freedom, you know, that I can um, do now rethink or do, not be trammeled by too much data, so to speak, or um, too many memories. No, I didn't think that. I didn't think so. Uh, I really it's genuinely had that sort of rather banal thought that suppose, you know, I sit here crying over the loss of some books and I think, what would I do if my daughter was dead or something mm. like that? Mm. That would be a serious cause for mm. grief. Not this. Yes, well that was very philosophical. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that that um, we got to that by way of your PhD, and and now you're teaching at Newcastle. You you said you weren't there very long, though. No, I was there for two years, and mm. then I, I went. Uh, the, the man I was speaking of who supervised me briefly, as mm. happens in Liverpool, went to Reading, mm. where which is a very tiny department, where he had a lot of power, so he more or less summoned me to Reading. Mm. Uh, mm. I was very glad to, mm. yeah, well, glad to join. I had a very good time. I mm. enjoyed reading very much. Mm. It's something that you ought to get in in small Cambridge colleges, I suppose. A very mm. tiny unit mm. of people with many common interests, mm. which they were willing to share. So Across disciplines, you mean, or within? Well, within the, the breadth of. Mm. Of sure. the various disciplines mm. that come under the heading of English, mm. yes. Mm. Yeah. Or Italian, or, or uh, with a Renaissance base, as you mm. were. Mm. Good medievalist, Joe Trapp, who became the director of the Warburg Institute, mm. uh, now dead. Uh, Gordon is also dead. In fact, everybody's dead except mm. me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, How long were you there? I was there for uh, 
eight years, mm. and then I went to Manchester. So that's between about 1950. 50, 58, yeah. Mm, 58. You were already beginning to, I mean, you have written many books. I'm very impressed by how much, and uh, may, uh, particularly large number in the 60s and 70s, I think. Did I? I can't <laughs> <laughs> you can't remember. Um, I, I, I do know that the my best books were written in, in that period. Mm. Do you enjoy writing? I do. And once I get going, I, I find it very difficult to start something. Mm. But starting a book seems an impossible thing to do. Mm. If even starting a review, mm. I'll find all kinds of things to do around the house before I begin. No. My favourite line, of course, is, all things can tempt me from the craft of verse. <laughs> and yes. uh, likewise, everything can tempt you from sitting down and starting yes. to write. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. And that blank, empty first page. I always write at the top, this is rubbish what I'm going to write, and I'll never use it, but let me just put down a few things. Uh, and that, that releases you. That's the way out of mm. the, mm. the uh, difficulty that Mallarmé mm. saw in his poem, uh, mm. Le vide papier que sa blancheur défend. Mm. Mm. Uh, it's the sheer whiteness of it that terrifies you. Mm. You get rid of that. I get rid of it by just writing, this is a preliminary, unusable bit of thought, and then I just start, and yeah. once it's started, it's not so bad. How much do you, you have, as I say, written a, a, or published a, very many books, did you set yourself an amount to write a day, or do no, you? No, no, no. And on a good day, how much did, did you write? Enormous variation in that, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember the, 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 the book, a book of mine which uh, was important from the point of view of uh, academic success, it was mm. called Romantic Image, mm. which actually happened. Uh, uh, I, I'd, I'd been asked to give a lecture, I was at Reading, I'd been asked to give a lecture on uh, a poem of Yeats, mm. any poem of Yeats, mm. because there was a circus, and mm. they didn't call it that. So I gave a, a lecture on, uh, in memory of Major Robert Gregory, mm. and uh, uh, while I was writing the lecture, I, th I saw all sorts of things I wanted to say. So I went, and in the course of the of a summer vacation, I had written that book. That's never happened to me any other time. And that's mm. just, just um, it was pure luck, really. Mm. Um, that it, it was like finding oil, whatever, mm, <laughs> striking mm. oil. Mm. <coughs> I, can't, I don't know why I've suddenly developed a cough in your <laughs> Don't worry. Um, so you wrote eighty, hundred thousand word book in, in two or three months of that, in that it summer. It wasn't as long as that. It was mm. more like 75, mm. I'd mm. say. Mm. Uh, yes, long, yes, long hand or by typewriter? Or? Typewriter. Mm. Mm. Do you always... Do you still work on a typewriter or a computer? I, I or? work on a computer, mm. yes. Yeah. And how many drafts do you of any? As many as I need, as <laughs> who can you say? Mm. I, I, you lose, of course, the computer facility of correction on the computer mm. means that lots of drafts are simply abolished before you get there. Mm. You don't know how many of them be. Mm. I go on changing them to the very last minute. Mm. The changing done in proof mm. yesterday. Are there are there any um, conditions which you think helps or encourages your writing? I mean, some people find going for walks, sometimes a small bit of alcohol, sometimes music. Um, have you ever noticed any any things which stimulate you to in your writing? I think silence is the best for me. Um, uh, I've tried music, as we said mm. before. Um, walk. Well, yes, it, it shortens the time available for writing. <laughs> <laughs> what else could you say? What were the other alternatives? You said? What you uh, alcohol. Alcohol. <laughs> not until you stopped. Not until you stopped. I found when I was an undergraduate, I couldn't start essays, and the only way I could really do it was to have a bit, very small sip of sherry. 
yeah. which somehow just relaxed me a bit and I could start writing. Yeah. It was a very difficult essay. I see. Well, that's not a pharmacological effect. 